because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Amen. When you have the opportunity to praise and worship God, that's, that's what you get. Every time you get together, we get together in a, the body of Christ and the temple of God. And it's by His word that we been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and you sing, holy, 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 and then you realize, as it says in Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. That's, uh, that's what we ought to have every single Sunday, and we do. Why wouldn't you want to come to church and get together and do something like that? Then open up your Bibles everywhere. No, anywhere. I got it wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Thank you. Praise and worship team. The people of God that just stand here in a place that's different than where you're standing. Thank you. People of God for singing your hearts out unto the Lord. It's for His glory, for His honor. And though we are trapped right here in the temporal, we sing into the eternal. And we think of those things that are eternal and we're mindful of his glory. One day, oh, Labor Day weekend for First Bible Baptist Church, it'll never be the same. And speaking of temporal and eternal, there's a young lady by the name of Don Marie Pratt, who one year ago tomorrow went into the eternal and no longer. Of course, at the moment of salvation, as the Bible teaches and as John's gospel tells us in Paul's prayer, that from the moment of your salvation, you're already eternal life, <laughs> eternally lived, you have eternal life in Jesus Christ, you might as well start living it. Well, Don Pratt passed from this earth into the presence of the Lord. And uh, that's a year ago on Labor Day weekend that will always be re remembered as right, happy, happy Labor Day weekend. And uh, we actually, you know, there's some tough parts and memories, but tomorrow we'll uh, think of the memorial of someone very sweet to us, someone that we love so very, very much. And uh, we talk about her a lot around here. We reference Don a lot and talk with her and uh, I still uh, I joke a little about it here and there but I'm always looking for her help you know send me an email or something like that and she hasn't been sending me emails in a long time so yeah worthy is the lamb you are holy what a beautiful time to to just uh, worship God and come together and and realize that we are undone. But when we start singing praises unto the Lord, you're this kind of, the eternal stuff starts happening in you. And well, that's Jesus saving your soul. Jesus giving you a new life in Christ, the Spirit of God in you. Something should happen, not because of the beauty of the voices or the sound or how the music is played, but it's just the opportunity to sing beautiful words unto the Lord, to lift up a joyful noise unto the Lord and to praise Him and to understand what it means to be a believer in Christ. If you're not a believer in Christ or things like that, you are a believer, but things like worshiping the Lord just really, uh, you don't have to sing like everyone else or jump up and down or anything, but something should go on inside of us when we read the Word of God as believers, when we hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, when we sing praises, whatever the, when the words give Him glory, when the words praise His name, blessed be the name of the Lord, that should be something that gets us going. And so we're opening up the Word of God, and a lot of you come to a church service for a lot of different reasons, and maybe it's for the music time, or the prayer time, or the fellowship, or uh, the Sunday groups did not meet this morning, except for... The investors holding things strong, way to go investors, yeah, way to go youth group, 
So all the young people and all the older people, everybody in between, they just couldn't get it together today. Just kidding. They gave you all a little bit of break. You know, I, I kind of wonder, though. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a, yeah, I, I, we won't go into that right now. We're going to get into the Bible. Here we are this morning, though, looking at a continuation and the finishing up of chapter number four in the letter to the Corinthian people. It is 1 Corinthians chapter number four, and, and uh, um, I'm going to just kind of highlight something real quick for you, and it should, uh, oh, did you, break my, did you break my thing? What'd you do, break it? Did you break it? Did you break it? I'll hand the reins over to you in a minute. But we learned last week uh, in the first 13 verses of the chapter an important principle. You see, when we go scripture by scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, whatever God gives us, we preach it and teach it. And that's what God gave us last week. It was how do we handle, how do we deal with, no, 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 no. How do we prove the ministers of Christ? It says up there, we need to know how we do that. We do it God's way. God's ministers, tried and true, are they? We spoke of how uh, judgment needs to be handled and also, to the teaching of the word that we are ministers of Christ, as it says in verse number one in chapter four, that we are stewards of the mysteries of God, that that's where the value is. It's not, oh, look at all the treasures I have on this earth. No, no, it's eternal treasures, and the value is found as the ministers of Christ being the stewards of the mysteries of God. We realize that being proven is a very important principle. Paul taught the church at Corinth. Why? Because he spent the first three chapters in this letter breaking down for them where they have gone wrong. That the wisdom of God somehow had been lost. The worship of man somehow superseded the worship of God. Not always in every way, but leaning on, hey, I follow Cephas, or I follow Paul, or I'm of Jesus. Oh, well, okay, so you're better than everybody. Not, I follow Jesus humbly in my salvation. So we realize that when we look at that first few verses, it's very important to know. Because again, as it said in verse number three and verse number four about being judged and the judgment hereby how it goes. The church at Corinth is like any other church. The last thing though a church wants to have in its heritage or when you look back is that, hey, they had two or three or four good years, but the last 20 had been not so good. We just celebrated the 25th anniversary, and there's been a lot of neat things. The biggest thing about it is not necessarily that there's a nice piece of land and not necessarily there's a nice building. No, it's the, the people of God. It's what Jesus Christ has done to save souls and for people to be discipled and learn the Word of God, to be incorporated into the body of Christ, the healing of some marriages, the healing of some families, the working through ministry challenges and then seeing ministry blessings. All those things are part of having... A church that started out in 1997 and is still going strong 25 years later. Paul the Apostle says, hey, church at Corinth, you better check out your ministers. Make sure the ministers, the spiritual leadership of God is right, that they are the proper stewards. We know as a steward, it's a minister of Christ whose duty is to dispense the provisions of the gospel, to preach his doctrines, administrate his ordinances. Also, too, as a minister... It's one who executes the commands of another. If somebody is a master over that minister, a servant, attendant minister, the servant of a king, it could be a deacon, one who by virtue of office is signed to him for the church, caring for the poor, taking care of the doctrines again, as well as the ministers of Christ do, that those that are in that position handle that position very seriously. It says that Abraham had a guy named Eliezer, and also, too, there was a steward in Joseph's house. So we know that being stewards of the men of God is very, very important. But we are called stewards in the New Testament. So we walked through all that. And we said, okay, when it comes right down to it, it's going to be love never fails again. Our study, love never fails, is proven out again and again that Paul the Apostle is this model. He is the model. He is the person we want to follow because he followed Jesus Christ. 
So ultimately, we're following Jesus Christ. As it says at the end of chapter 3, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. We realize that Paul is really dedicated to this church and all the other churches because of his love for them. And last week, if you remember, we got into some sticky stuff in verse number 9, 10, 11. He says, I thank, excuse me, verse number 9 of chapter 4, for I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as they were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, to angels and and to men. It's like, hey, if you want to just put us in the ring and, and have us just be a sacrifice as people, and being beaten down in the arena of entertainment, fine. I guess we're just a spectacle. He says, verse number 10, I guess we're fools for Christ's sake, but we're wise in Christ. We're weak, but we're strong. It goes on and on and on, and he talks about how we're despised, but also honored. And then he goes down there in verse number 13, and says, ministers of Christ, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the off-scourging of all things unto this day. And I will say in that teaching going through all that is really helpful us to understand what it was like in Corinth in this church when things got out of control. God's control. Not man's control. Out of God's control. Out of the Holy Spirit of God at work. The ministers of Christ were not put in the place of honor like they ought to be. The men and women of the church lost track of what they ought to do. So what do you need to do? As a church congregation, you prove those ministers. You make sure that they're tried and true, and that's what we walked through last week. So this week, we're reminded as we go through verses 14, down through the end of the chapter, what it's going to look at as us in spiritual children. The sons of God. The Bible says in John chapter number 1, But as many as received him, them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The Bible's simply telling us that when you come to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a son of God. You are a spiritual child in Jesus Christ. So many of you have a spiritual parent. Maybe somebody led you to Christ. Maybe something had to do, somebody had something to do with your salvation. So Paul's going after this today in verses 14 through 21 through the end of the chapter saying, hey, how are we doing with our spiritual children? Here's a thought, a question for you. So think about your salvation when you got saved. Did somebody have something to do with you coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Can you remember? He said, huh? So does somebody have something to do with me coming to Jesus Christ? Would you raise your hand if there's someone in your life you can think as, hey, they, they, they have something to do with me coming to Jesus Christ. Come on now. Does somebody have something to do with that? Most all of us. Did it come out of nowhere? Well, there's been spiritual papas and spiritual mamas in your lives, and there have been people who had something to do with You coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Here's on the other side. I won't ask you to raise any hands. How many have you led to the Lord so that you would say, I have a spiritual child. I know everybody belongs to God the Father. That's what Paul clarifies. But they're your beloved son. Like Paul refers to Timotheus and he says, hey, this is my beloved son. He refers to the people at Corinth as beloved. Who are your beloved sons and daughters in Jesus Christ? Your physical family? Are your children? There's nothing quite like seeing, witnessing, being part of sitting there when one of your children calls out to Jesus to save them. I know I'm a sinner. I know the Bible says so. I understand all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. And even at seven years old, I know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I realize that, Jesus, you, while I was yet a sinner, you died for me. I realize there's nothing I can do to earn my way. I can't go to heaven because my parents are Christians. I can't go to heaven because I have sin. And the only one that can take away the sin 
is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I realize, God, that what Jesus Christ said to the disciples is true for me. The only way you can come to the Father is by Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I realize, for by grace are we saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When a precious little child, or a 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 year old precious child, like the gentleman that got baptized last week, a couple weeks ago, there's nothing quite like being in the presence of that other than the person that's actually getting saved and being translated. Spiritual parents need to carry a serious responsibility for that. Are you a spiritual parent today? If you're not, maybe that would be a good thing. For you to be so dedicated to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would bring the gospel and as you're praying for someone new would see them get saved and you would say I, can, can I be in your life as a spiritual dad or mom can I be a parent parenting you through this walk because we are the children of God it says up there as well Spiritual parents, speaking of you and me, spiritual dads and moms need to grasp the commitment of love that Paul had for God's children. Do you have a love for one another? This theme keeps on coming up. It must be important to Paul. It must be important to the author, the Spirit of God, as we know that it's given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. This keeps on coming up. Paul had an incredible commitment to God's children. Do you? Do I? Do we really have the commitment to all the children? Because Paul called Timotheus again his beloved son. Epaphroditus. And all the long list of men that he has listed that are sons, brothers, co-laborers, companions. Do you and I grasp as spiritual dads and moms the commitment that's needed and the love that Paul showed for God's children? Or do we say, hey... Listen, I tell you what, grab some mission. We got a missions conference because they asked when a conference come out. So the missionaries are going to come in and give us a report. They must be doing a great job. We've given them the money to go out and do it, so we're all set. So then what does that do for you and me? Well, I'm all set. Ah, the pastors, we pay them. We've got this culture and where we live in church that somehow is contrary to the scriptures of what we just preached last week about the ministers of Christ. We support them well, we give them pay. That they'll take care of the responsibility for us that we're supposed to have, all of us as believers, like Paul had. Somehow, some way, we think that those people, the missionaries, the ministers of Christ, the pastors, the, all of them will pacify the conviction you and I really get when we see Scripture like this and go, wow, I have conviction for my lack of commitment for people in the body of Christ. And is it more so that I have a lack of commitment for the gospel of Jesus Christ going out to people? Paul is telling this church, you lost your way. I don't want us to lose our way. You say, Pastor, are you saying that we lost our way? No, I'm saying we can. We're always on that edge. Just like this church is only four years old, maybe five tops. And this kind of letter is coming in. Wait till we get to chapter number five and six. Oh, my. Paul breaks down stuff. In fact, he ends chapter number four, getting you ready for the correction and the discipline of chapter number five. This passage right here alerts us to our possible failures. But also, it gives Paul's keys to success. I didn't say all failures. I didn't say we're failing. I said our possible failures in some areas. This church is failing a little bit in some areas. 
And Paul gives us keys to success. How do we parent spiritually? Every one of you is a spiritual child of God. You are one of the sons of God. How are we parenting you? Well, we offer some incredibly good Bible studies. You're right. But he'll talk about the 10,000 instructors here in a minute. This isn't a complicated introduction in that it just sets up for something very simple. Here's the spiritual parenting that we have before us. Very simple. That's just the simple title of our message, spiritual par parenting. And all I have for you is as we read through this scripture, is you go through each one at a time, each one at a time, and go, okay, good. Paul's keys to success are sitting right before us. So let's go into them. That's why we open up the Bible, so that we can be taught by God. That is profitable, again, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Pick up with me in chapter number 4, verse 14. I'll read the passage, and then I'll just give you some really quick bullet points, a few of them that fit each one of these verses. Here we go. Verse number 14. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. I wonder if that's hyperbole or if they really had 10,000 instructors in that church. Wow, that's a big church. The church of Corinth was very large, by the way. Verse number 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Wow, what a testimony of Paul and Timothy and the Lord in their lives in verse 17. You could go a long way with that verse. Verse number 18 through 21 kind of brings this tough little, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wake you up to the discipline that you're going to need, the correction that you're going to need. Look at verse 18 through 21. It kind of has a, has a message here for us at the end. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. That's going to come up again in chapter number 5 about sin. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, verse 19, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? What will ye? Shall I come unto you? I read this verse when we started the series a while ago, a number of weeks ago. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? How would you have me come to you? Well, I'm coming to you with all pieces and parts. I'm coming here as a spiritual dad. But I know that the Father in heaven is your father. And when I think about spiritual parenting, Paul's saying, hey, there's some things that you can do, some keys, some tips in order to parent the children of First Bible Baptist Church and also for the church at Corinth. When it says love never fails, spiritual parenting, when it says all that stuff and you look up at that, you say, well, I don't know if I'm really in the mood to parent. I raised all my kids. How many of you are grandmas and grandpas? Raise your hand. Are you wore out and tired? No, you're not. You can't wait for those babies. I heard. Sorry, you can't wait for the. Where are you? And then you hand them back and say, ha, ha, ha. When I think of that part, it's kind of easy chuckles. Spiritual parenting is tough but we're supposed to be doing it. It's not just Paul's responsibility, it's just not mine, and just not a few people with lighter hair or lesser hair than you. So this morning, in the way that I'm going to go through these in the next few minutes, I'm going to do it kind of a reverse way. Let me, I'll, I'll just give you a shot at seeing this. Here, first one. A faithful spiritual parent speaks more than just a heads up. Hey, let me give you a heads up. 
A quick heads up, somebody's coming by. Hey, I just want to let you know, I just want to give you a quick heads up. I just want to let you know something's happening this week. I just want to, hey, heads up. Or there's a ball coming in and you're going to get hit in the head. Heads up. You could never figure that out, could you? If a ball's coming in and somebody overthrew and it's going to possibly hit you, why would you look up? Because you're not going to see it anyway. Well, it's the whole idea is you look up and you can see it. It's just about to hit you in the head. Look up. Now it hits you in the face. I'd rather hit it in my dome. This is really hard. Everybody that knows me knows I have a hard head. But my face is very gentle and it will hurt. Let me give you a heads up. Let me give you a spiritual heads up. Paul's doing a little bit more than that. So go ahead and click it. Paul spoke strong words. So heed the warning. He didn't just give a heads up. Hey, I got your heads up for you. No, verse 14 says to me, I write not these things to shame you. Heads up, you're bad. No, no, he says, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. As a spiritual parent in the spiritual life of someone who's come to Christ. You say, you're always talking about, I'm not talking about just let's get the discipleship books out. Let's get the program in. Let's just run it all through. It's you and me deciding that we will parent those that have come to Christ while we were part of that in some form or fashion. And if you weren't part of that in some form or fashion, how about if you grab some spiritual child? Why don't you just lead somebody to Jesus and somebody used to say, well, could you give me somebody else to disciple? How about if you just win somebody to Christ? I heard it works that way, didn't it? Tomorrow I'm going to go up to Liberty and I'm going to baptize a young man that I had a chance to be part of when he came to Christ a couple months ago. I'm going to baptize him in the pool. The pool's pretty big, so we'll baptize him. It's my responsibility a little bit. He's reading the book of Romans right now and we're answering questions back and forth. It's a responsibility. You lead somebody to Christ in your office, what do you do? Eh, I don't have time for you. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You're a spiritual papa to Noah. Well, I mean, can I walk with you? Well, Anthony, stepdad. <laughs> Step. here's, here's what we're looking at. I'm warning you, if you don't do this, things could get messy. Here's the strong words that are coming. Not just the heads up. Be aware of the children that are the sons of God in your church and do something about it. Remember this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 24. Paul completely understands his place in it all. And he's not saying that he over supersedes God. 2 Corinthians 1.24 says, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. He's just reinforcing what God is saying. That's 2 Corinthians 1.24. The next one. A faithful spirit, excuse me, a faithful spiritual parent loves with more than a shout out. Loves with more than a shout out. What do you mean? Well, if you go to a football game currently or a baseball game in the summertime, I asked Marge if we still had a baseball team. We do. The Royals are still here. Praise the Lord. That's good. I know they've lost 80 games. They only have the ability to lose one more and they could still be 500 for the season. But you go to a football game. And you say, hey, there's my son. You give him a shout out. Hey, I see you over there. Hey, good job. Jude, you're awesome. Shout out. Shout out's good. Shout out's good. Everybody's shouting out. I heard your husband got thrown out of a football game the other day. But then they let you back in, right? Jesus loves you. This I know. I know you didn't do anything wrong. I know that. And now, there was other times... And he recognized your voice. Praise the Lord. You have a distinctive voice. Yes. You were preaching. You were preaching the gospel, yes? Oh, okay, okay. The gospel of Tyler, maybe. He could be. But the shout out is just a shout out. Paul loved the family. Paul loved the family. With more than the shout out, he said, remember the relationship. 
He says in verse number 15, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. I have begotten you. That's personal possessive. I've begotten you. He's not taken credit away from holy God, but he's saying, I've begotten you. The church got started because I came and I preached the gospel. All glory to God. Remember what it said in John, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number, 10, uh, chapter number 3, verse number 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. God gave him the ability to lay the foundation for the church by the gospel, in the spirit of God. Here's the word to do it. And another build it thereupon. But let every man take heed how he build it thereon, thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He says, I love you. I'm not just giving you a shout out. I'm not just saying, hey, I just, hey, the bare minimum, I got that. I can do bare minimum. No, he's saying, look, I speak strong words more than just a heads up. I give you more than just a shout out for love. I tell you that I really love you. Now, here's the goofy side of it. Sometimes in this churchiness, in this sticky little clanky, ugly competitiveness over instructors, sometimes that happens in church. These instructors, they offer their services as instructors. They send you tapes or their, gosh, tapes, gosh, that's in the 80s. What am I talking about, tapes? Podcasts, download my app, check and follow me. But he's saying, Paul's saying, look, you really only have one that loves you like I love you because I'm father, dad, spiritually speaking in your life. Remember our relationship. Please understand that when you have a bunch of instructors that just want to give you information and instruct you and then walk out of your life, they're not showing the love that these children need. You say, well, that's just the children in faith place. I'm talking about spiritual children. And I wonder if the percentage of people that have never grown beyond knowing that they're saved, born again, and they can tell you three Bible verses are still sitting as children in God's church. And they can be tossed, and, tossed about, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You say, all you're doing is talking about discipleship again. I already mentioned, that's not what I'm saying. I'm preaching and teaching the scriptures as it says. And Paul said, I love the family. Remember the relationship. Next. A faithful spiritual parent models more than a life coach. Now, life coaches are good. Maybe you're a life coach in someone's life. And maybe you're coaching them through life. That's fine. A lot of times a life coach does what they have to do. And when it gets messy or sticky, they'll stay with it for a while. And then the life coach will say, hey, let's make another appointment. The life coach will still make another appointment. A spiritual dad or spiritual mom, spiritual parenting doesn't mean we just make appointments and do it according to a few hours here and there. I joke with the guys and the phraseology we use. I, I have to go to discipleship right now. And I understand what that means. I do. But as the old fun joke says, discipleship, spiritual fathership, spiritual parenting doesn't happen with you and me staying at home. We have to go to people. And beyond Sunday, we have to go to people. Paul modeled Jesus Christ well. All he's saying is follow the example. Follow the example. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. That sound like a good verse, Bobby? Verses number 12 and 13. We covered that a little bit yesterday morning when Pastor Bobby was talking through our men's prayer time. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity and spirit, in faith and purity. Verse 13 says, till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation to doctrine. He's telling Timothy, until I come, till I get there, be an example. Be an example of the believers in word. Exhort people, which means to entreat them, comfort them, encourage them. Admonish them if you must. Get into the doctrine, make sure. But Paul's saying, look, I'm modeling Jesus Christ. It says in verse number 17, excuse me, verse number 16. Wherefore I beseech you, 
Be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says, And these things, brethren, I have been figured in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Jesus was never puffed up. Jesus was never full of pride, obviously. He was humbled. He was humble all the time. That humbleness, that servant's heart, that type of stewardship is what Paul modeled. To your spiritual children, fathers and mothers of the born-again sons of God, may I ask you who's following you? And are they following you as you follow Christ? Or are they just following you? And you know you're not following Christ. That may lead the church to be in a mess sometime down the road. I hate to have that happen. Again, another one. A faithful spiritual parent sends more than a token effort. You know what? A token effort. That can be related to any physical activity, but how about spiritual token efforts? I prayed with you. I went to visit you. I made sure that you were covered. I sent you a card. Now, on the other hand, all those are incredibly awesome. When they come from the heart of a spiritual parent that's not doing it as a token effort, I just got to get this taken care of. You know how sometimes it can be that way, but for some of you, it's a love of Christ where you are pouring into other people, the sons of God, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and you're just like Paul the Apostle who says, I sent proof of my teaching. I sent proof of teaching. You know the faithfulness that I have? Well, I sent proof of it. Verse number 17, I mentioned this verse when we were reading it through. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son. Lystra, Derby, book of Acts, first trip. Second trip, he reconnects with him, and he goes with him. Timotheus is beloved son who came to know Jesus Christ as Savior under the ministry. He's faithful in the Lord, he says, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways. So he's going to tell you about my ways, which are not in himself, but in Christ. There's a proof of his teaching, as it says in verse number 17 at the end, as I teach everywhere in every church. That means Paul, in his faithfulness, to the Lord has been proven so there's proof of his teaching and it's glorifying to Jesus Christ and it's found in the fruit of his life what fruit do you have in your life on this earth of men and women who are following Jesus Christ because you spiritually helped be a father or a mother a spiritual parent in their lives there's a lot of incredible, powerful stuff in that. When you think of what Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Philippians 3.17, you're reminded of the deep teaching and the faithfulness of Paul and how he was passing on and saying, Hey, mark those that are an example. Grab a hold of those people that are examples and grab a hold of those people that are faithful and see that the proof of the teaching is in the fruit of that person's life. The last couple are found in verses 18 through 21. Here you go. Here's the next to last. A faithful spiritual parent walks better than for a show. They thought Paul was doing all this for a show. He really didn't care that much. Oh, you're Mr. Apostle of the Year guy. You're Mr. Church Planter, Mr. Missionary. You're the teacher. You're the pastor. We know you. And guess what? We know that you're just doing this to let us know that you're still the man. A faithful spiritual parent walks better than for a show. Do you or I get to a place where we are involved in other people's lives spiritually speaking so people will see us and it'll be for a show or is it like Paul because see Paul walked in the spirit and he tells them know the power Paul walked in the spirit he says know the power that's in my life 
Verse number 18, scriptures. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. They're trying to find a matter by which to put him down to say, no, you're, you're, you're not going to even care that much. You, all you're doing it for is for a show. No, no, no. I walk in the spirit of God, and when I do, I do that which I have the ability to do with power. It's spiritual power from on high. He says in verse number 19, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power for the kingdom of God is not word, not in word, but in power. If you remember, Paul the Apostle wrote in Romans 14 that the kingdom of God is not this fleshly stuff, the meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and his name. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's in the word of God. It's by his name and the Spirit's power that glorifies and gives honor to Jesus' name. And it's in the Father's authority. Who is this Paul? And what made him so constantly better? His desire and his commitment to Jesus first and then to others. He really loved people. Stop telling me that you can't be like Paul. He would rather have you not say that. He's teaching you and me in this passage about, first of all, the ministers of Christ, and then about being a spiritual parent that we need to take a hold of some people's lives and say, hey, in the Word and the Spirit, we can walk and grow and be more. Remember he said at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 3, first few verses, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. But he said he still wanted to speak to them. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you have not been able to bear it, neither, will you be, neither now are you able. He cares about them. He knows they have divisions. You know they walk as men. They walk in carnally. But he says, you are my brothers in the Lord. You I love so much. And I'm not just here to just give a tip to God, write a sticky note, or say, hey, I'm here for a show. I'm here because I really, really, really am walking in the spirit of God and the power of God. And that's the only way I'm going to get through this thing. Remember what he says in 2 Corinthians 12. And I know Bobby quotes that often, but he says, hey, the more I'm loved, the less I am. <sighs> and that's what he says in chapter 4 as well. And he says, hey, we're defamed, we entreat. Whereas the filth of the world and the off-scourging of all things unto this day. And it was okay. Lastly, we finish right here. Verse number 21. A faithful spiritual parent corrects with more than do as I say. I guess we all can relate to this one. Paul's not just saying do as I say, but a lot of times we tell people just do as I say. Well, he wrote it down in a letter and he just sent it to him. No, 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 you got to say, you got to be reminded here, we got to say, he came there. And he spent 18 months there. And then when he heard there was a difficulty, he wrote to them about the issues that were in chapter 5, which we're going to get to. Then he wrote a really long letter. <laughs> and then he wrote another letter, and then he came to him again. He really, really says, do as I do, not as I say, but do as I do in the power of the Spirit of God. Do it by the love, the faithfulness that I have. That's what's going to proclaim the glory of God. Paul corrected them out of love. Welcome the discipline. Just setting you up for next week, so I only spend about a minute here. Here we go. When you see what he says in verse 21, he says again, What will ye? Question mark. Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Broken hearts are good, but destroyed hearts are bad. He doesn't want their hearts to be destroyed. You know the old phrase that I heard years and years ago, rules without relationship may lead to rebellion. I have a relationship with you. I'm correcting you out of love. You come in a spirit of meekness. Welcome the discipline. Because I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to correct some things here. I'm going to use the spirit of God's power. I'm going to use the authority that's been given to me by the holy calling of God. I'm going to be working and operating in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to get a handle on that. Just to be reminded what it says in the scriptures. 
We know it says in Hebrews chapter number 12 about the chastening. <laughs> For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Love compels us to challenge sin and to challenge unrighteousness. Would you not warn your children when they're headed into a bad spot? Would you not warn your spiritual children? Why have we become so much more concerned about ourselves? It's because we're by nature, we are. Church of Corinth, they were as well. Up on the screen is our finish. The temple of God is us. We ought to be a deep-knitted family of spirit-filled parents and children. Go parents and children. Say, well, i got to go pick up my kids. You know what? Leave your children here today, moms, dads. Just leave them. And everybody that's working in there, they'll take care of your kids for you just like you would. They won't, will they? The believers in Christ that you have had a part in their lives coming to Christ... Who's going to care for them more than you? So the question for our invitation and prayer is this. What are we as spiritual parents doing with the responsibility of our spiritual children? Or just call the office and get them involved in someone else's life. Maybe they can be discipled by someone. How about you and I as spiritual parents taking the responsibility of the spiritual children that are around us and really being committed like Paul was with love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer? I'll repeat that question as you are in an attitude of prayer. The music is going to be playing and I'm going to make a prayer with the Lord for you and with you. What are we as spiritual parents doing with the responsibility that we have for the spiritual children that we know of? What am I doing? Father in heaven, this is just a time of prayer, but it's not just a time. It is just the right time to come to you in the name of Jesus by the wooing and stirring of your word and by the spirit to respond. What are we doing? What are we going to do? Would we be found by you to be completely stirred and convicted to do something about the spiritual state of our spiritual children? God, work in this time of prayer, this time of invitation. And lastly, I pray if there's anyone here that has never received Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray for this moment in time. I pray that maybe, just maybe, they will be completely convicted to come forward. God, that would be a great time to be able to show them by your word how to become a son of God, a child of God. Lord, bless in our invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand. Please stand. We'll take a couple minutes, maybe longer if God would lead us.